Hi, welcome to our event. I am Jennifer Chase, the Associate Provost of the Division of Computing, Data Science, and Society. We are thrilled to host two special guests from NASA headquarters, Dr. Shell Gentleman and Dr. Lika Guatakurta, and a delegation from NASA Ames and of course, to host all of you, both in person and online for this conversation and opportunity to connect. I'm thrilled to see students, staff, faculty, and partners from across and beyond campus. Hello to our online participants, live stream or watching the recording. I hope the energy comes through on the screen. Why are we here? We are here because open science and open source tools and platforms are the future, the future of science and society. Berkeley has a long tradition of open source contributions in research, education, and impact in the world around us. And of course, NASA has an incredible history aiming high and reimagining what's possible. Indeed, my own first exposure to real science was NASA missions when I was a child. I think many of us were inspired by NASA to become scientists. Together, especially with NASA designating 2023 as the year of open science, we have an incredible opportunity ahead of us. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Shell Gentleman and Dr. Lika Guatakurta, who will each speak about NASA headquarters and innovations for open, collaborative, and interdisciplinary science, bridging fundamental discovery with social impact. After their presentations, we'll have a broader conversation about how open source science is transforming the landscape of research, education, culture, and more. We're so fortunate to have Fernando Perez, member of our statistics faculty, the co-inventor of IPython and Project Jupiter, which Nature just last year recognized as one of the top 10 computer codes that transformed science. We will have some questions ready, but we welcome your questions. We ask that you write legibly, please, on the cards that are circulating, anonymously or not, and pass them to the aisles for our team. Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Shell Gentleman. Shell Gentleman is science lead for the $40 million five-year Transform to Open Science, that is TOPS, mission at NASA headquarters. TOPS goals are to train 20,000 scientists in open science, to enable more than five major discoveries that use an open collaborative science approach, and to double participation by historically excluded groups in NASA science. Shell is an advocate for open science, open source software, and inclusivity. As a physical oceanographer focused on remote sensing, she has worked for over 25 years on retrievals of ocean temperature from space and using that data to understand how the ocean impacts our lives. Please join me in welcoming Shell to the stage. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm Dr. Shell Gunneman. I'm a computational remote sensing oceanographer. Basically, I study the sea from space. I have over two decades of experience as a 100% soft money research scientist, working on national and international satellite missions from creation through closeout. I was the PI on a $200 million mission proposal, and we published our science proposal openly on Zenodo. I have worked in closed, competitive, proprietary environments, 
and open, competitive, collaborative environments. And I'm an open science advocate because of those experiences. Now, I'm at NASA headquarters, where I'm the science lead for the Transform to Open Science mission, TOPS. We have a team at headquarters working on this out of the Chief Science Data Office. Some of the biggest breakthroughs were enabled by open science. For example, the first image of a black hole by Dr. Katie Bauman. She developed her algorithms, building on the open source contributions and libraries that have been developed by the open source community. This would have taken many, many more years without that base to start her research from. This is how science moves faster when it's open. Also, astronomers see carbon dioxide on an exoplanet for the first time. This was just published last month. Dr. Natasha Bathala is an open science expert for the NASA's TOPS mission. She said, first of all, we had open collaboration. We had 341 people on a Slack channel years before James Webb was even launched, all learning how to work together, how to collaborate together, and deciding, like, how are we going to publish together? Let's get all of our governance planned out so we know who's doing what. The data was made public immediate upon collection. There was no embargo period so that they had a head start on anyone else. They made it immediately accessible. When they did their publication, all the software and all the data were also available. So anybody could take all of their results and reproduce them. They did it on an open preprint server and they published open access. This is what our big discoveries are gonna look like in the future. And if we move more people to open science, we're gonna get more of these big breakthroughs because you're not writing everything from scratch, you're building. You're building together and you're building with the community. Here's an example of how we've done science for a long time. And this is an uh, example from my field. Uh, this was actually one of the first things that I started working on uh, right after I finished my master's. So in 1990, there was a very high, okay, it, was, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> uh, but it was, there was this really highly cited paper. It said, in the upper atmosphere, we don't find any warming. Therefore, all of your global climate models are wrong. And they went to the floor of the Senate and they testified about this. They said, those climate modelers, they don't know what they're talking about. There's too many errors. You can't make any policy about climate change. You can't change anything because the scientists don't know what they're doing because our data says that their models are wrong. The data was open. It was just really hard to get. So eventually, they found in 1998, some authors got the data and they looked at it and they said, oh, okay, there's the solar wind, the altitude of the satellite decays, that changes the angle in the upper atmosphere, that changes the height. That's actually now, it's not that cooling trend, you can actually see the solar wind events in the trend. Um, and once you correct for that and a couple other things, that, that was that artificial cooling trend. It actually is warming. It was in the data all the time. It was just only one group was looking at it and they made a mistake, not intentionally. We all make mistakes. So more eyes, more everything helps us get better data and understand it more accurately. It took until 2003 for them to rewrite that code. So that's 13 years later. They finally got the software rewritten because the original authors didn't share the software. If you wanted to actually look at this, so like this is showing, even with data open, if you don't share the software and you don't share the results, it takes a long time to progress science forward. If they had made their software open and there had been hundreds of people looking at this, we would have solved this a lot faster and a lot better. And that's what open science is doing. If you want to look at these two papers, yeah, you can't do that because they're behind a paywall. <laughs> right? So if you wanted to actually study what went wrong here and look about these, People at Berkeley, at a privileged institution, where your, your university has negotiated a, you know, free access for you. I was never at a university. I was always at small private companies and nonprofits. And I saw these paywalls every single day, every time I tried to look up a new research topic. So NASA's defining open science as accessible, reproducible, and inclusive science. And we talk about that, when we talk about accessible, we went open data and open software, but we want to go next step further. We want open data software. We also want it to be fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We want open access to scientific publications. We want everyone to be able to share knowledge, especially when it's federally funded. And information, so we want open meetings. Like, why are science team meetings not broadcasted so everybody can participate in them? When we talk about reproducible science, 
we'd like to see more people using open collaborative analysis tools that are reproducible so that anyone can take your code or anyone can take your result and redo it using open tools, frameworks, and libraries. And we're starting to financially support those through funding announcements. We want inclusive science because we want to support diversity, equity, and belonging. We want to expand participation in science and create new pathways to science. And this is not something that like, oh, wouldn't this be nice? This is a great idea. It'll make everyone feel so great. This is evidence driven impact. We know for a fact that open science creates research that's cited more, it has a bigger impact, it increases transparency, and it generates more collaborations. And that means that you get these collaborative projects, you get access to this hidden knowledge, equitable systems, and you get more people to participate. And we know we need that. We are looking ahead at some really, really big complex problems. We know we need more we science than me science. And we want to be sharing data, software, and results openly. We have to have this. In addition to like changing how we actually do science, we know we need to change who is doing science. We need more people, more hands, more eyes, more brains. We need more diversity. And again, the evidence is overwhelming here. Diverse groups not only ask better questions, they get the answers faster and they have more impact. And so we're using open science to do this because it accelerates the pace of science, it increases the impact of science, it expands all of these applications, and it shares hidden knowledge and expands participation in science. And we need, we need both of these things together to do the next decade of science. So NASA has the Open Source Science Initiative. This is designed to unlock the full potential of science. It's $20 million per year that NASA is putting into open source science. Within that $20 million a year, we have four different areas. First, policy development. I stay away from that area. <laughs> there are people who love that area, and I am very happy for them. We do need to change the policies, right? If it takes a year to release eight lines of software, that's a problem for scientists. That's a problem for science. So we are working on the policy development both at headquarters and working with the centers to improve software release authorities and agreements. We also have core services. We can't do open science alone. We have to have the cyber infrastructure, the data repositories, and the software repo repositories in order to enable open science. So this is starting now. There's a whole series of workshops. It's a three-year project to sort of revision what sort of support we need computationally, the infrastructure to support open science. Next, we have ROSES Elements. ROSES is NASA's competitive funding vehicle. It comes out every February 14th, right around there. It's a joke, you, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's within uh, the Chief Science Data Office. It's supporting open source software tools, framework libraries. This is where the TOPS announcement comes out to support adoption of open science. So this is, we're funding open science, and we're funding things like NumPy, like Matplotlib. We're trying to fund these foundational components of open science. And then there's TOPS, because we realize we can create a new ecosystem, but if we don't bring along the scientific community with us, we're going to be sitting there alone with yet another big government invention that we thought everybody would come to the party, but nobody showed up. So that's what TOPS is about, is advancing adoption. And we know that Every community that we've talked to, and we've been going around, I think I've given 65 talks in the last year. We've been going to every community across NASA and talking to them about where they're at with open science. And what we find is every community is a little different in how they do open science and where they're at. So we do see open science as a spectrum, and we're just trying to move everyone towards more fully open in ways that they feel comfortable with. And as they get more comfortable, then they tend to move more and more towards openness because they start to reap all of those advantages and those benefits. And we want to do this now. There's this global and national momentum, and I am not lying. There is a huge amount of momentum behind open science right now. And that's why we've declared 2023 the year of open science. 
we have all of these tools like Jupyter and Archive and Orchid and we have Binder and Zenodo, we have repositories, we have all these capabilities to do open reproducible science that we just didn't have even a few years ago. And then here we have plans and policies around the globe that are being updated to support open science. I mean, Germany just announced that they're gonna count software in their funding decision. So if you do open software, that now counts towards whether or not you get funding for German nationals. Uh, lots of countries are releasing these different open science plans and starting to recognize and incentivize open science because equal and open access benefits the public. So TOFS is a $40 million five-year mission to advance the adoption of open science. We have two key, three key goals. 20,000 earn open science certification, double participation by historically underrepresented communities, and five major discoveries. And we're gonna get there through a whole bunch of different activities. And this is a summary, like TOPS has four areas of actions. Those four areas are all designed to support those three key goals. And the first is visibility. Oh, everywhere we go, everybody has a different definition of open science. So we are working right now on a federal definition of open science. And then communicating that by being at a lot of meetings during 2023. We're going to be at all the large meetings talking about open science with keynotes, with panels, with town halls, with booths. We're also developing this online free open science curriculum. It'll be on open edX. It'll also be workshops that will be deployed so that anybody can teach the workshop and get people certified in open science. We're going to be funding uh, virtual cohorts, science team meetings, all sorts of summer schools that will be teaching this introduction to open science. And a big focus in that introduction is all about community. Because we can teach people about the tools and we can teach somebody how to drag a file over and get a DOI from Zenodo. But what we really want them to do is we want them to learn how to work with each other and learn community norms in open science so that we all start to move forward together. Because it's that community part, like we can do, you can check that box and you're gonna advance science. But if you actually learn how to do collaborative, inclusive science, we're going to go further faster. We're doing incentives, so we have this open science certification. We are funding prizes and challenges and awards. We're looking for also for, uh, to support big open science awards with societies and internship programs around open science. And we're trying to change the game. We're trying to level the playing field so that we're not just inviting people to sit at our table. We're changing what the definition of that table is, what the definition of science is, so that more people are participating and we are meeting people where they're at rather than inviting them to come and do science where we are. And that is, we are gonna start requiring open data, open software. NASA has a scientific information policy that was updated about a year and a half ago. The update to that policy will be released within the next month. And there are, I believe, 238, this is for the policy people, 238 shoulds that have turned to shalls. And I never appreciated that as a scientist, but if you're a policy person, you're gonna be like, oh yeah. Um, so, <laughs> That shall means that you shall share your data, you shall share your software at time of publication. So we're not taking it for at the, we're not trying to push everybody to where they're uncomfortable, but we are gonna start requiring more open science practices, doing dual anonymous peer review because we know that that advances equity in science. And the funding decisions are gonna to start to consider open science activities and ask you about them. And there's awards, promotions, and evaluations that consider open science activities in teams as well as individuals. We also want to look for teamwork. So this is how NASA is going to try to push the whole field forward and towards adopting open science. And we're starting in 2023 with this year of open science to really kick things off. And then we're just going to continue and we're going to start requiring a little bit and then we're going to start requiring a little bit more and then we're gonna really start requiring things. So we need to be partnered with universities. We need to be partnered with all other organizations so that as this starts to move forward, we are all moving in step together. And we know the results speak for themselves. I mean, the, the breakthroughs that I showed at the beginning are just also the breakthroughs throughout science. And you can see like, you know, here's, uh, uh, illegal gold mining, they took an AI algorithm that was working in Peru and they moved it to Ghana. 
and they were able to detect more illegal gold mining. There's all sorts of examples here of how people, when they share code, when they share data, when they start to work together, they're advancing science in all sorts of new and different ways. And we invite you to get involved if you're an institution, if you're an organization. So thank you very much. And at this point, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lika Guhatakurta, uh, who is a senior advisor for new initiatives at the Goddard uh, Space Flight Center and, and uh, a program scientist at NASA headquarters. She has uh, led the development of heliophysics as an integrated scientific discipline, uh, leading a program called Li Living with a Star um, that thinks of the Sun-Earth system as, a, as, a, as an entire integrated system. Since 2017, she has also been the driving force at headquarters and aims behind the growth of the Frontier Development Laboratory in applied AI. Um, and she's going to talk to us today about some of those initiatives in building interdisciplinary team science at NASA. Thank you, Lika. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando, Jennifer, for uh, inviting me to this audience. In fact, my introduction to Fernando is through this open science kind of collaboration. Otherwise, how does someone like me actually get to meet him? So this is, this is already, you know, even though we talk about NASA putting momentum behind open science, it's started, started a long time ago, but having a dedicated uh, sort of presence from an agency like NASA is just absolutely going to accelerate what we were already building. So what I'm going to do uh, today is, uh, actually Shell gave you a really great overview of what is happening at a top level in Science Mission Directorate, and I'm going to take you kind of a little bit deeper into the area of heliophysics and application of AI, broadening that as an interdisciplinary power and, you know, an accelerator for uh, discovery, um, and um, end with some of the open science um, issues that we are also facing. So machine learning is becoming, of course, a key tool for science. We know that. And NASA's heliophysics division has been sort of learning by actually doing it, you know, pushing the limits uh, of what's possible in ML. That's what we've been doing through six years of partnership with um, Frontier Development Lab. That's a partnership between NASA Ames Research Center, SETI Institute, and Trillium uh, Technology. And Trillium Technology, James Parr, is sort of the creative director of Frontier Development Lab. To better understand our star and predict basically its interaction with Earth, you know, just like terrestrial weather, there is something called space weather that is entirely created by the sun. It doesn't show up on radar. And if you want to leave low Earth orbit and explore space, then you cannot leave home without really understanding what heliophysics does. So this talk is a general overview and strategy of what's possible when ML is applied to science domain with really massive heterogeneous data sets we are talking of, helping both to safeguard and improve life on Earth, unlock the secrets of the universe, and better understand Habitability, these are some of the core goals of heliophysics. And what I'll do is I'll showcase uh, some cutting edge applications of ML to the typical sciences through the lens of heliophysics, but you can apply it um, anywhere, which will provide a unique view of ML's ability as a tool for exploration and discovery. And a lot of the talk of open science platform, AI-ready data, data, kind of stems from this concept. This is the heliophysics observatory, just to give you a sense of why we build missions and what our data looks like. This is really 20 operating missions with 27 spacecraft, crisscrossing essentially the distance from sun to earth and all the way into interstellar medium right now with the voyagers kind of in the interstellar medium, not even in sun's domain. This is our source of data, and this is just an um, overview of sort of these satellites, okay? So in addition to our NASA missions in heliophysics division, we also 
uh, take data from NOAA satellites, other space agencies, and here what you're seeing, that the satellites are actually color-coded for their observing program because heliophysics division is about as interdisciplinary as it gets, really. So the magenta kind of represents the area that studies thermosphere, ionosphere, mesosphere observation. The Space Sciences Lab here at Berkeley, actually, they do a lot of missions there. The yellow is, of course, the solar observations and imagery. The cyan blue is geospace and magnetosphere, and the violet is heliospheric observations. These are remote sensing, radio observations, in situ observation, the whole gamut, very heterogeneous. Now, why do we do all this, right? To get data through which we gain better understanding of the domain that we are studying, basically. And what we find ourselves to be caught in is that there is currently in heliophysics over 8.7 petabytes of compressed AIA images, atmospheric imaging assembly from Solar Dynamics Observatory, the fabulous pictures that you see from the sun. You know, uncompressed, this would expand to over 20 petabytes. And this number keeps on increasing with ground-based observatories from National Solar Observatory, like DICAS. And this variety of data and volume of archives has given rise to what we call today data science. And size isn't the only issue. There are over 230 million AIA images that we have to deal with. So by the time you sort of read this sentence, NASA gathered approximately two gigabytes of data. It's about every 15 seconds, okay? And that is from our 100 plus currently operating missions across all the five divisions that we talked about. We do this every hour, every day, every year, and the collection rate is growing exponentially. Handling, sorting, and managing this data is a massive undertaking. Our data is one of our most valuable assets and its strategic importance in our research and science is huge. And that's kind of what has led to this open source science, right? We have to make our, make our data accessible, fair, reproducible. Very quickly, I think I'm going to talk about uh, what we have achieved with this data and through the partnership with Frontier Development Lab. And, uh, you know, we have invested a lot of resources to really develop helio and cross-divisional topics through the Frontier Development Lab, which has been a public-private partnership, as I mentioned earlier, resulting over two dozen ML projects, over 30-plus publications. And what you see here, you know, this is integration of physics and explainability that is enabling AI to become a powerful tool of discovery. We take data, we do science with the goal of really discovering new concepts, new ideas. And so there are some examples I have given just to show that this is not just science for science sake anymore. This is science that is also relevant to return on investment or life and society, whichever way you want to go. So Super Resolve, for example, is an example of workflow optimization, which is cost and time savings and results in enhanced data products, bringing together 50 years of solar magnetic field data, you know, cross calibrating them, space-based, ground-based, different agencies. And if you're able to do that, you know, our science productivity will be amazing. Creating virtual instrument is an example of forecasting and prediction. Create virtual instrument, which predicts extreme ultraviolet irradiance, enabling visualization of SDO instruments that have actually failed in orbit. And I'll give few of these examples. Make forecast is an example of applying decision intelligence with rapid assessment and improved strategic decisions, like, you know, prediction of GNSS disruption. We are doing this and doing this in incredibly short amount of time with really heterogeneous uh, sort of interdisciplinary team. And extract 
you know, insight from noise is an example of anomaly detection, mapping star paths, you know, hidden in test data, for example, or auto calibration, cross calibrate is an example of autonomous systems uh, with onboard uh, AI auto calibration, which is resulting in resource efficiency. And I'm giving you these examples because the application of AI ML with our data and open science approach, uh, there are breakthroughs in many different domains. This is the example that I was giving you. This is Solar Dynamics Observatory malfunction. One of its sens uh, sensor that was measuring extreme ultraviolet irradiance stopped functioning. And the question was, can we take the data from the other instruments like AIA imaging and really create an algorithm to predict that sensor data. And we succeeded beyond our wildest dreamy, a dream and outperforming some of the physics-based model. Then the question became, if you have actually created this ML pipeline, SDO ML pipeline, can we utilize this? This is the derived outcome which becomes very important for future. And, and the question becomes, can we do auto calibration? So EUV imager actually will suffer degradation in space, but we can apply AI ML tools to actually create that synthetic data set for which we don't have to fly our rockets to get measurement to cross calibrate that data. Or if we have this SDO ML data pipeline, can we create um, data product for thermospheric density? And thermospheric density is really important for figuring out scintillations that affect GNSS satellites many other things. So we are actually testing this and finding that most of these results actually outperform the current state of the art. And these kind of topics are getting done essentially in two months during summer. Now the physics that leads to fluctuation in ionospheric electron density that causes this scintillation uh, also manifest themselves in the auroral structure. So the question was, can we take some of this ionospheric data and bring the auroral imager to do a better prediction for GNSS uh, disruption? And that was absolutely amazing. The bigger the auroral image, what we found, greater is the disturbance that we feel. So this is, again, open data or creating open data really creates for discovery space science that we didn't know existed. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is Parker Solar Probe. So the question was, can AI help us find the complex structure in the solar wind? It's, it's a very tedious process, essentially. And I mean, can we know that can learn to find, organize, and classify complex structures in the solar wind to advance our understanding of the fundamental building blocks that make up the magnetic field of the solar wind at different points in space? Now, we know that. For example, the top panel shows from left to right, you know, some of the structures that over time we have discovered interplanetary coronal mass ejection. The first detection was in 1971. Interplanetary magnetic field enhancement, first detection was in 1983. Switchback, the first detection was 2019, came from Parker Solar Probe data. And the question is, what next? The pipeline is really able to identify distinctive features and group similar time series into recognizable patterns using only 3 million operations instead of the 90 trillion from the traditional approaches. So you can imagine you know, how we are accelerating science. And the findings basically reveal multiple clusters of solar magnetic field structures. And as we go get more data and integrate them, uh, you know, we are going to find new stuff. This is star spots. You know, the question was, can we use, for example, um, Kepler data to find some information about stars. Now, you know, telescopes like Kepler and TESS measure brightness over time on single pixels for stars that are light years away. ML can learn from essentially faint um, starlight observations to explain luminosity dips through uh, 
basically com uh, competing plausible hypotheses in terms of extra solar transits. That's how we kind of figured out, you know, uh, this exoplanet uh, concept. It can go after spot formation and the rotational characteristics of each star. So modeling spots on other stars via deep learning is what was done in this particular topic. And the pipeline called Starry Spotter transforms Kepler light curves into images, stacks them, and then applies computer vision to extract star uh, spots properties. These are, these are really kind of cool concepts great for PhD topics, postdoc level, or any other, just utilizing all our data. This is just giving you a portfolio of the topics we have engaged in in the Frontier Development Lab, and you can see it covers the whole gamut in Science Mission Directorate. So let me quickly now go to some of the other areas that I want to touch on. The reproducibility problem in AI is well known, as um, Shell was already talking about. 38% uh, yes, that's sort of the crisis, and 52% uh, yes is a significant crisis. That's how the community views this. This was in a, a Nature paper. So the question becomes, you know, uh, like many AI research projects, even the ones I'm showing, we find that uh, they stall midway to maturity from TRL 1 to 4 uh, when it goes from TRL 5 plus. I mean, it's called the GitHub graveyard. And then, so we are going from open science question, we are doing great, but we are not deploying them. AI in use within the community, that's kind of where we want to go. And there are many reasons for that, you know, uh, different specialists, uh, different incentive mechanism, you know, perhaps not enough funding, which I think the TOPS program will help solve. Now, sharing AI on GitHub is like sharing half the manual and saying good luck. I mean, some of those problems are uh, going on. And I give you this uh, recipe for International Space Station, which essentially gives you an insight into the history, the development, the collaboration, it's, it's worth looking at. So wh what are the issues, you know? There are still significant engineering bottlenecks to creating generalized tools, okay? Uh, data prep is still a costly and difficult endeavor informed by specialist knowledge. Compute is a barrier to entry, even though we want to lower that, you know, especially with big data sets. These are some of the learnings from everything we are doing. And of course, lack of trust, that's a very big one. Sort of not invented here kind of approach, right? It is a perennial issue, and we absolutely come across that too. To address a lot of this is, I think, where we have gone in SMD to create this open science platform. And I'm going to give you just examples of Heliophysics, a digital resource uh, library. I showed you all our, um, you know, uh, spacecraft. So how, how do we manage all that data? So the vision is where the heliophysics system observatory comes together, right? Now, individual missions can, of course, do great science, but unlocking groundbreaking system science requires HDRL. Helio Cloud comes very quickly after that because how are you going to distribute and make this data accessible? And you already know, you know, it's connecting people, data, paper, software in the heliophysics community. Not going to elaborate on that very much because you're familiar and I'm giving you examples of one discipline and what we are doing to undertake this challenge. There is HPD policy on open science. This is, I think, she'll describe both of these charts, this one and the ne next, very adequately. So I'm not going to add voice to the heliophysics component, right? Each division in SMD has slightly different way of engaging their um, community. And so they come up with different approaches adhering to the basic goals and the framework that has been set up. So. What have we been doing to cross this known stall, stall point that I had um, talked about before? And, you know, 
We are using our competitive research tools, um, FDL-like mechanism and other funding mecha mechanisms, you know, really to push the community to come up with this exciting science and create uh, AI ML data pipeline. Um, then uh, we have also been, uh, uh, you know, uh, benchmarking results and providing the um, uh, the tools to streamline trust basically benchmarking is something that is extremely important if you want to kind of go from trl4 to the next level uh, then we have provision of annotated notebooks ard data snippets video introductions all of that creation of mlops toolboxes engaging universities to run capstone projects to mature AI pipelines and develop tooling. And this is something we are doing inside the division for right now, but adhering to the principles of TOPS. Now the question is, the last question that I had in one of the previous slides, trust. How do you build trust? You know, sharing of AI-ready data and ML products in in a standardized way that helps others basically to assess the quality of the data set, which in turn can fuel reuse. Something that Shell brought up, these are complicated problems. Reproducibility is important to build up trust and foster science enhancement and open science as researchers and scientists can build on their findings and workflow. So these are challenges, we are trying to kind of articulate them and figuring out how to approach them. Uh, there are a few more slides left, I'll try to go quickly. Uh, two key propositions for um, AI leadership, if you look at this, this is I'm still talking, the TRL 1 to 4 and then TRL 5 plus. One is to catalyze derivative science that I talked about, I gave you some examples. The other is continuous optimization of AI outcomes by the community. If you think of how Unix or IDL developed, you know, it, they were open source platform to which the entire community contributed. We have to keep at it on the AI front also. What works today will become stale in two years. So th these are investments we have to make. And why do we do that? Because it gives us faster, better, and cheaper kind of access to creating discovery signs. And I want to play this um, video for you just to see how AI and science is gaining traction at Google. Prediction models faster and more cost efficiently. This speeds up response time, helping get people and resources where they are needed most. Likewise, Frontier Development Lab, in partnership with NASA, Google Cloud, and others, has created the first 360-degree view of the sun. Using AI, they combine data from three NASA satellites, making it possible to observe the sun from any vantage point. This will help scientists better predict the impact of the sun's activity on our planet. They're also using AI to see the moon's permanently shadowed regions as if it were daylight, an important step in lunar exploration. Finally, they've built models that take existing satellite images and transform them to represent accurate flood predictions. The okay. And I'm just going to end here, and this is just sort of a cartoon to describe kind of some of the difficulties uh, we still have to overcome in the world of TRL. So uh, now we're gonna have a panel discussion. Remember, please, um, if you have questions for our panel, uh, please write them on index cards. I think uh, we are collecting the index cards here, okay, and they'll be given to us. I'm, I'm going to start. Fakul on this side and Ellie on this side. Um, if you can raise your hand for a second, they will be collecting the index cards. Okay. So I would like to start off with a few questions as we're collecting those questions for our panel. Uh, so the first one is that 
reflecting on your journeys, uh, and I know you all have these different paths uh, to open source science. Uh, what have you learned that others here in our studio audience <laughs> and those um, and those online uh, might might benefit from? So I don't know what one of you in particular like to start. Lika, I'll I'll, I'll start. Um, I I think what I would tell the audience is that don't be afraid to break the stovepipe approach. I think that's what I have done all my life. I, I did astrophysics and general theory of relativity for my masters. Then I went into solar physics, which is still astrophysics. And then I went to NASA headquarters to really be a program scientist leading actually heliophysics division's biggest program, Living with a Star. Started with $20 million with no missions to its name. So the entire point of that program was, can we really sell the science so that Congress will continue to fund us for all the big missions that we flew? And, and that's where the open science uh, interdisciplinary collaboration, collaboration with other agencies came forward. So I created something called uh, TRNT, Targeted Research and Technology Definition Team. We have never done that. We do, do this for science. Uh, missions, actually, payload, but not for science. That, that just kind of really changed the entire approach to what we were doing in heliophysics in tr terms of bringing system science. And I, it seems like I, did, I didn't know whether that was a one-time thing I did, but when I came to Ames, it seemed like it followed me, whatever my passion is, because Frontier Development Lab was very much like that, except that it's much broader and bigger. Okay, so, uh, Shell. Uh, so, what have I learned along my journey? Uh, <laughs> I, I was talking with someone today about at my Twitter pinned tweet on my profile is all the mistakes that I made to get to NASA headquarters. <laughs> and I, I, my sister is here, she helped me write that. And <laughs> uh, it started off a lot with a lot more bad words, I think. Um, but all through my career, what I thought were mistakes ended up being opportunities to think different, to move in new directions, and even when I started learning Python, it, you know, you, I came for the code, but then it ended up being about the community. And I think that the thing that I've learned throughout my journey is that you just have to always keep an open mind. And as one, one thing shifts, it doesn't, it never, nothing I ever started ever went the way I thought it was gonna go. Everything goes sideways, because that's what science is. And part of what makes you a really good scientist is how you respond to those as opportunities rather than barriers. And so I continued to do that through my whole career. And then when I took a leap of faith and learned Python and the cloud, then that got me to NASA headquarters, where now we're working to build even more community and more open science. So I guess my advice is, is community, 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 and never let anything stand in your way because it's always there's always a way around it. <laughs> okay, Fernando. So yeah, I've, I've had uh, certainly an, an odd path in all of this. In, in that I, so I, I came, I'm, today I'm faculty in statistics, uh, having gotten a PhD in particle theory, having come to Berkeley as a software engineer in 2008 to work in neuroscience, uh, of all things, uh, and, uh, and in the meantime, having managed a project in computational biology at LBNL, the, the common thread in that craziness was always computing built in collaboration with others who were who were willing to participate. So the, the very early days of the scientific Python ecosystem, which is what brought me here to Berkeley, hired by Jared Milman, who's in the audience, uh, was a, a, a motley collection of Matplotlib, a tool that many of you may have used, was created by a neuroscientist studying epilepsy in children. 
Um, one of the leads, the person who ended up creating NumPy, was a medical imaging researcher at the Mayo Clinic. Um, SciPy and the company behind it and thought was founded by an electrical engineer doing radar scattering for the army at, at Duke, mostly like tank radar scattering. Um, and IPython was my excuse to procrastinate on a particle on a Lattice QCD PhD. What brought us together at those conferences was the joy of working together. And quite often, the disgust about the hyper-competitive uh, and sort of cutthroat nature of each of our individual fields and the lack of interest in participating in that. And what, what has been a joy in that world is finding that, yes, it may take a little longer. It took me 15 years from PhD to having a, a more stable job here at Berkeley, and that's not okay. I don't think we can expect the next generation of scientists to wait 15 years before they get a job. But at the same time, along that journey, I did find people who wanted to get together to build things in a different way. And that process has created hugely impactful things that now underpin both science and industry. Right? The reason today Google builds TensorFlow or Meta, Facebook builds PyTorch on Python is not an accident. It's because over 15 years, scientists adopted those tools for many other things and built other foundational layers, and they did so in that spirit of collaboration. So yes, science sometimes can be seen as a zero-sum game. That is actually what turns most young people off of science. The most frequent complaint that I hear from younger scientists is they don't want to be in a world where they're kind of poking the eyes out and gouging the eyes out of their colleagues and fearing for their own eyes to be gouged out. And I think we can try to build communities that operate in a different way. I think the challenge for us is as we start having the resources for some of this to be done on a larger scale, is not to fall into those patterns, because there's a reason why those patterns emerge in large systems. It's not that previous scientists of another generation were horrible people. Those systems tend to emerge naturally. And so I think that's the challenge, as we think how to do this at scale, is how to capture the good part of that spirit of collaboration and maintain it in a better way that doesn't lead to that pure zero-sum thinking always. Okay, so lessons for many of you and still for us. You know, I'm <laughs> probably further along in my career than all three of the panelists, but these are, these are very Im important lessons uh, about nothing ever going the way that we thought it was going to go, especially that is, uh, I, I think that's the story of many of our lives and honestly, much more interesting lives than if everything had gone the way we thought it was going to go. <laughs> so uh, this next one I'll, I'll post first to Shell and then we'll, um, so share more about what you think works well and what is challenging in open science practices to support discovery. You are leading this, you know, new TOPS mission. And, you know, and so I assume in, in building that mission, you have thought about what is working well and what is actually challenging in open science practices to support discovery. Right now, Within the open science community, the, the community is working well. The, the citations are starting, you know, you're starting to get data citations, software citations. The field is moving forward and towards more openness. Where we're finding, I think, our challenges are is that we're in this gap. We're sort of at a gap year where the incentives aren't yet in place. And especially early career people feel like they're being asked to take a risk to participate in open science and they don't yet see the rewards. And I think that's one of the things we're really trying to address with by starting to have awards that specifically target teams, that specifically target open science, and to have these moonshots, these grand breakthroughs based in open science practices, because we don't want to ask people to do something that is not going to, that will maybe affect their career choice or their career path or their opportunities. We want to make sure that everybody sees the value in open science and that we start to have the incentives and reward systems in place. Okay, Lika, what, what do you think has 
worked well and what are challenges in open science practices? You know, in, in, in your realm of heliophysics, what have you seen leading I, large projects? I think the challenges still are, I, I think it's great that NASA has taken on the challenge, but I don't think the resources is sufficient. It, it, it doesn't even, so, you know, just like we opened up space and now we work with the private sector, I think we should be doing that. I think we should be bringing the Googles, the NVIDIAs, because at NASA, I would say we do, don't have also the needed skill set for computational capability that we need, algorithm development. So there is a bit of reinventing going on. So it's a great start. It, it's yeah. awesome that we can start and we can sit here and say we are doing this. But as we are doing this, I think we have to spread out and figure out how to make it a larger pool of resources, both um, dollars and technical. So, uh, Lika, you've, you've just hit on the notion of scale and scaling. And so to Fernando now, I bring this same question about what works and what's challenging, but I'd like you to think about it at the level of, so many of us know that Fernando is um, the inventor of IPython and the co-inventor of the Jupyter platform. Right now, each month, there are 9 million active Jupyter Notebooks on GitHub. Uh, so, so we've achieved some scale there. But what's working well and what's not working well at that scale? I think what one thing that, and, and I think we, we see evidence uh, of this that work extremely well is how fertile that space is for for creativity, right? The 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 really low barrier today that exists for somebody, basically with an internet connection and and often like just a reasonably modern laptop. But we're not talking about. I mean, we're talking about something which is within the reach of really many many people, right? To assemble cutting edge tools, access data, and begin playing with new ideas and doing new things. The tools are phenomenally powerful and. A lot of the friction that we had years ago, I mean, when Shell was saying when, when you kind of really got the religion uh, a few years ago, it's because you saw people doing things that for you with tools that you were publishing research with, you knew was month, months worth of work, all of a sudden, like, this is being done in minutes. And, and, and that, that is a game changer and that that can be assembled quickly allows for creativity, for it lowers barriers. Uh, for many, and I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I think what's much more challenging is, and Lisa's, uh, Lika's uh, GitHub, gra GitHub graveyard term is one I've never heard, but it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, right? Um, that really, I, I hadn't thought about that, but it really is, it really hits the nail on the head of how do we sustain those efforts, right? How do we transition to things that are actually have longer term viability because that initial burst of creativity, of playground, of assembly, of energy, okay, what does that become over time? And, and that's both a question about the tools, the, the projects, the practices, but it also crosses into the institutional side with the people. What are the careers? What are those tasks? This came up uh, during the lunch conversation. Ellie brought up the question of what do we do with the jobs that also are required in terms of documentation, in terms of maintenance, in terms of community work, uh, in terms of sustaining those efforts. And once you begin fitting that into formal incentive structures of these are your careers and this is what you get merit on and this is what, it is harder. So we have, we've lowered the barriers for those bursts of ideas, of creativity, of exploration, but I don't think we've figured out how to do the longer-term sustenance of whether it's kind of the engineering language that NASA uses and that I think Lika was referring to, that's very educational, or the career, human, institutional development. And I don't think, I think that's, that's really difficult. Okay, well, so as we talk about institutions, you know, there, there are, we, 
We like to think of open science as uh, bottoms up. Okay, there's a lot of open science that has been created bottoms up, grassroots. That's very, very important to the ethos, to you know, the fact that it has grown as something open. We are starting to see more top down with TOPS, for example, the new mission out of NASA. Um, there are other, also other top-down kinds of things that we can see from funding agencies, from, you know, when we um, look at studies of disciplines that occur every 10 years or so, professional societies. How do we connect these this realization among some at the very top that this is something that we need to nurture and these grassroots efforts. How do we bring those together to create something sustainable? So any of you who have thoughts on that? I, I, I can start. Um, I mean, it, it really requires, at that level, political will and resources. And where do you get political will from, right? Congress has to give us money. So we go to the academy and we ask them for a study. But I think a lot of the way, as I was saying during lunch, the way we have been practicing our science and our research portfolio is very dated. It has to be agile and faster uh, to keep up uh, the pace. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I am really interested in hearing the young voices who are actually enmeshed in there. They know things every time I talk to them. They know things that I don't know, and I learned so much. But because you know I'm a science manager, I come with this authority and land up taking time speaking. But those are the voices we need to enable and teach the teacher is kind of a great thing we have practiced at NASA, NSF, other places. One teacher uh, will teach a bunch of other teachers. You know, it's just basically this is Department of Statistics, right? It, becomes exponential. So if we can kind of adopt each one of us that attitude of open science by inspiring few people and continue to pass that and push that out, uh, I don't think people can stop us. OK. Shell? Uh, how do we evolve? So like the bottoms up and the tops down approach, and how do we change those to support scientific discovery? I think there's often uh, the bottoms approach. I mean, in open science, it's been a lot of volunteer effort. And what we're trying to do is we come in as a federal agency to make sure that we don't disrupt that in any way. Because this is a very successful model. But if we're coming in with funding and with support and with infrastructure, how do we ensure that we don't affect in a negative way, all of a sudden there's money on the table. And that changes things. And that changes relationships, and it changes dynamics, and it changes development. So we're trying to be very careful. And I think this is how we're trying to evolve our approach, which is to really listen. And so one of the things we've been doing with TOPS is we have monthly forums where we really try to listen. And we say, we're thinking of doing A, B, and C. Is that what you want? Is that what you need? Is, is that the right approach? Do you have other ideas? Please tell us because we think we want to hear, we know we want to hear from all of you. We don't want to develop a big federal program and then just, you know, put it like mayonnaise, really thick on a piece of bread. Like that is not what we're looking for. We are looking for co-development. And I think that's part of this evolution towards open science, is this evolution towards a new platforming voices that have not been at the table before, creating a more equitable science. And so that's the other thing that I think that we can look at is, as we're evolving both these approaches, is to really take a hard look at equity 
in this and how we are advancing not just the traditional people who will be advanced by this, but all of the people that we need to participate in the next decade. So, Fernando, you have been one of the leaders of the Bottoms Up. You now are such a leading voice that you can help somewhat in the top down, but, uh, you know, how you've, you've been on both sides of this now. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's something that is extraordinarily challenging. I actually have learned already from what NASA is doing and, uh, and what specifically what Shell is doing at TOPS. I think is is the right approach. the The challenge is that the the bottom up the bottom up approach is is one where multiple stakeholders, in a somewhat chaotic and complicated way, but end up participating in a collective effort of creation. When I mean, right now we have been we're in the process of we've just rewritten effectively the governance rules for the project for Project Jupiter. It's kind of our third governance model as the project grows and scales. And there, one of the key considerations has been how do we design a model for decision making, governance, and participation that allows one engineer, one community person in Argentina, in Colombia, in Bulgaria to participate on a reasonably equal footing with a team of engineers at Amazon or at Google or at Microsoft who are developing product which is strategically important for those companies, which were therefore has at that scale infinite resources more or less, right? And how do you establish the process? But it also d doesn't mean demonizing those teams. We want those teams. They are productive. They have interesting problems and they have resources. But we also don't want them to overwhelm, right? This open space of voices that often have not been heard. How do you design structures for that? And then the, we, I think we have this bizarre kind of geometric mismatch because we have this kind of horizontal space of all of these actors. And then we have our verticals of NASA, the university system, the federal agencies, et cetera, that come in and they have their needs as well, right? They can contribute, but how do we build this interface between these two kind of mismatched geometries of community, between communities that have a need for a concept of line management, right? How do you do, how do you line manage when what feeds your project is one engineer at the other end of the world and one team at Amazon, right? And it's still part of your, so that I think is the really interesting challenge that we have right now. I think what Shell is onto with the listen to those voices is at least a key element. And we have an example of that today, the audio glitch. Right? We have an audio glitch here for a few minutes. We learned because an engineer from Argentina texted me, like, I can't, we can't hear the audio. She runs a project uh, in Argentina to teach computing, uh, it localized to local culture and to the local language inspired by American institutions. Those voices are there, and they're there in the room with us right now. But how do we combine them with federal law and you have to answer to Congress. That's the challenge. You know, it's, it's very interesting as you say this because um, I think we, we are founding a new college. We're hopefully close. Uh, right now we're the Division of Computing, Data Science, and Society. And, uh, and as I look at what has happened with these platforms, so much of society has become decentralized, including science, um, for better and for worse, right? So it's more equitable. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's harder to know what are the right ways to organize that. It allows certain voices to become disproportionately powerful. We, we went from a world which was much easier to manage, which was a centralized world, politically, scientifically. And we're moving to decentralization, which is much more power, because you are drawing on the brilliance of the world, of the engineer in you know, in South America who texts you of, all of these communities. So how do we, we, we have not learned as a society how to harness that power, how to use it to 
enhance uh, the creation of resources and the fair distribution of resources. Uh, and, you know, and that is now playing out in science. So how do we harness that creativity? How do we feed that ecosystem, which is evolving? How do we feed and support that ecosystem? How do we put in useful incentives from, from above, as you are doing with the TOPS program, as the agencies have always done in the best way to put incentives where things that might have emerged from the bottom, people up there are hearing it and then it is going further. So, you know, so I'm, I'm finding this a really interesting reflection of what is going on in society in general. Now I have a few, um, a few questions from the audience. So this is probably from some of the younger voices. What is NASA doing to keep early career folks working in AI and ML as industry, you know, and we have the same problem in academia, <laughs> as industry comes in and offers uh, more lucrative options. Is it directed at anybody? Oh, yes. 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 So, yes. NASA people, yes. certainly. I don't know what yes. NASA is doing. Yes. Well, you know, this is being live streamed, so I need to <laughs> watch myself. Um, I would say that NASA could and needs to do a lot more. We are behind. Um, the examples that I gave you, the resources that we have spent on Frontier Development Lab is really nothing compared to, you know, one of our smaller missions, a CubeSat mission, right? Yet, you have seen kind of uh, the breadth of topics, just the examples that these kids have been able to do during two months of summer. So that, that's kind of an example. And what did we learn there? that doing it only as NASA doesn't work. We have to bring the private sector and academia to work with NASA. And that, that's kind of what I believe in. That's what we have to do. Um, the private sector has already built sophisticated tools, workflow, and uh, they have the resources, the compute capability, the academia, they have the talent. We have to work together to build this future. And that's what we are doing in, at least in my division, we've been doing this for a little while. And I cannot tell you uh, the joy it brings me. I w used to be AI agnostic before I came to Ames, and I'm a proselytizer now. The power of what it can do, and not just science, from HR to everything, if we put AI to good use. It can transform our world. But that's where the rub is, political, right? Political will. I, I don't know how to solve that. So I'm, I'm going to go on to another question because we don't have so much time. Um, so there are, there are two questions I've got here, and possibly these are related to each other. One is how might we move beyond or think differently about metrics for success. And the other is, in what ways can we involve more groups that have been excluded or underrepresented to develop skills and take leadership positions in data science? So I think these are, these are not the same question, but they are very related questions. And uh, maybe Shell, uh, you can answer that one. So. I think that we've been having a lot of conversations uh, with many different groups, uh, especially from communities that have been historically excluded. And what we've been hearing is you can, uh, let's say we have a funding announcement. Anyone, it's, it's equitable. Anybody can apply to that funding announcement. 
But what is ending up happening is there are institutions that have more resources. They have more successful proposals that they're sharing with each other. They have complete data management plans that they're just handing to each other to get. So even though the barriers may look like they're the same, they're actually quite inequitable. And that if we want to bring more people into science, we need to actively work to identify, recognize, and try to remove as many barriers as we can to participation in science. And it's not just, you know, here's some open data or here's some open software. Here, come into our environment and work with us. But it's meeting people where they are at to understand what their needs are and trying to get science to where they're at that we're really going to start to broaden participation. I don't know if uh, either of... No? Okay, so... Um, so... These were included in the same question, and I think they're somewhat different, but can you discuss and say more about incentives and competition? And maybe they're not so different. And the imposter syndrome. So that was the, um, and I just want to say, before I turn it over to them, I suffer from the imposter syndrome all the time. I just want people to know that. I look like I think that I know what I'm talking about, and, uh, and I might have something to say, but there's a voice in me that says you don't know what you're talking about. And it's just over the years, <laughs> I have learned to counter that voice and go on, and I've been so lucky because again and again, I'm not caught. You know, how you're an imposter and you're gonna get caught. So, uh, so I just want, want everybody to know that, um, you know, uh, your insides uh, do not necessarily manifest on the outside. Okay, <laughs> and uh, do not compare your insights to somebody else's outsides. Okay, so uh, so competition and incentives and the imposter syndrome. Yeah, I, I actually think uh, I also I sometimes joke that for me it's not imposter syndrome because I'm actually an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> Right, uh, I am, uh, I was hired, um, this is being live streamed, so this is really dangerous, but I was hired as a professor in one of the world's absolutely top four and foremost statistics department, knowing very little statistics. <laughs> um, and that was terrifying. It was, I remember sweating the first day that I stood in front of a classroom, right, um, because I have the oddest path, right? Uh, particle physics and then applied mathematics and then neuroscience and then managing computational biology and data science and bids and blah, blah, blah. And the, today, yes, I, I am delighted to be able to say that some of the things that I've been involved with, not thanks to me, but thanks to a collaborative community, because the credit goes to the teams that have really built things around me, and those that I've been able to build on top of have been successful. But all of that started in failure, right? And I think it's really, really important that we normalize failure, right? When I am invited to give a keynote and somebody has the kindness of reading uh, a bio with a few achievements and accomplishments, I'm grateful. But I also try to remind people that there is a lot of failure in that path because I don't want the students who are in the room to think, well, that looks amazing, but look at what I have in the back of my mind and these challenges. I, I started writing IPython as my PhD advisor fired me on my fifth year, now granted, I was working for a very toxic person in that department, but still, he fired me on the fifth, fifth year of my PhD, and being fired as a foreign student in the US on the fifth year of your PhD is not the best career move, just in case you were wondering, right? It's just not, not exactly the way to go. Um, because if you actually get kicked out, within two weeks you have to pack up your bags and leave the country, otherwise you become illegal. And so that wasn't exactly a high point. And IPython was effectively my way of saying, I may not be able to do physics, and I may not be worth much for anything in science, but at least I can do this thing. And out of that, what happened was, I put this little thing out that I did for fun in private, hiding in depression, and somebody else, Travis Oliphant, 
responded and said, oh, that's cool. We should put that into SciPy. Other people said, I want to use that. Here's an idea for you. Here's a feature. Out of that came some of my closest friendships in my life, some of the people that we have in this room that I've worked with for 15 years, and the building of, a coll of collaborations that led to an ecosystem. It was out of that failure and out of being an imposter in particle physics. What got me out of the imposter was the willingness of others to collaborate, not because I could give them a paper, because I couldn't give them a paper, but because they wanted to build something together. And I think there's value in that, but especially in recognizing that those failures are inherent in the process. They're not an accident. They are simply part of how we build what we do. You know, uh, it is four o'clock right now, and I think that is, um, and, and I hope the students here or the postdocs here or the people who are trying to figure out what their next career move is really, really heard that because, um, you know, some of the most creative accomplished people follow these strange paths that uh, be because they are creating something new and it is almost never easy to create something new and yet I feel that this this community is attracting people who are willing to take risks to create something new. The world is coming around and we're all here to lend you support as you do that. Thank you. Okay. Oh. My, I was supposed to ask you for something, but I don't know. What gives you hope about the future of open source science? One sentence each. What Shell and the Top team are doing right now is what gives me hope. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> I think that NASA took a strong position in this, really enables um, the younger um, generation to know that there is some support behind it. How long it will be, I don't know, but that's huge. I think that at this new initiative, and we have been going all in to really try and create a new science, a new type of science, an inclusive science, and we have already run into some major challenges. And what gives me hope is the way that all of the NASA community and this open science community has come together to help us try and move forward and solve them. And that's what, that's what is giving me hope, because none of this is easy. It is messy. It is challenging. It is hard. It is really hard. But we have so many people like Fernanda, like Lika, like you, that are all in on creating a new type of science for the world. We want, we want science, we want the future to look different. For me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here at Berkeley with this data science major, which is four years old, the fastest growing major in Berkeley's history. We're graduating between seven and eight hundred students every year. This has computing, it has statistics, it has human context and ethics, and it has a domain emphasis. And it is attracting a group of people who don't look like the people who have come into computing before. It's already over 50% women. We have to make sure that we can really maintain that access and make it broader for racial and ethnically underrepresented groups as well. But I see those people coming up 
They want this. Those are the people for whom you are creating these platforms. That is going to be their home. You are building the civilizations which these people will take up and really uh, change our world with. So that gives me great hope.